Back in 2010, Minecraft was a wildly different game than it is today. Notch had just started the infinite terrain generation and all the NPCs were made by Doc and looking a little strange at the time. What makes this version of yesterday vastly different than today's version? Structures. But what is a structure and what makes it so essential to the game we all love today? To understand this, we're gonna have to take a slightly deeper dive into understanding exactly what a block is and why Minecraft loves the mighty cube. Anybody who's played Minecraft any time in the last 10 years has seen the show coordinates ticker. Now seeing this, you've probably understood growing up with the game that Minecraft truly is just a giant grid. Thinking of the world as a giant grid, that would naturally make every single block a point on this grid. And following the simple rule set of every collider must be cubic, we can simply extend the point in half a step in every direction to get a solid one by one cube. Now a block needs to maintain a few things. The position, the idea of the texture per face, the block type to know what kind of footstep noise. The list goes on, right? So essentially we just have this idea of a point in a grid that maintains a few variables. Building upon this, it's essentially Legos. We have different types of blocks and we can build an entire world out of it using grass blocks on the top layer, stone blocks in the lower layer, so on and so forth. Those of us old enough to remember will know that the earliest Minecraft worlds were literally just a super flat world, almost entirely made of grass. Now the reason for this was just simply spawning complex shapes was too much of a ball ache at the time. He hadn't done the infinite generation, hadn't added the simplex or Perlin noise in. And Notch was lacking a way to cohesively spawn large structures. Now we're going to think about this in 2D at first to try to make it a little less messy. So here is a 2D slice of a Minecraft world. Now we have our world, but what if we wanted to build, say, a tower, programmatically? Using nested for loops to try to spawn all these blocks over and over would be arduous and frankly a lot of thinking over just, oh, plus one, minus one on the J, and it would be furious. Surely there's got to be a better way, right? Well, with this concept of a structure, there is. If we could maintain a list of, say, multiple blocks in a specific orientation and spawn them all precisely in that orientation, that would make things a little bit easier and it would get rid of the overly intensive CPU load of nested for loops. Well, what is a structure? If we go back to thinking about the block, we know that these are just data structures. They're just concepts that we define. A structure is no more than just a list of blocks, right? So let's try to maintain a list of blocks. In order to do this, we need to follow a few simple rules. One, we're going to need to know the exact distance from origin that we're spawning it. We're going to need to know the position, right? Two, we're going to need to know all of the blocks specific relative position to each other. And three, we're going to need some way of identifying each structure from each other when we have multiple types saved. Sounds pretty simple, right? And it is. I mean, truth be told, it is simple. Uh, the entire data structure's definitions were done in a few minutes. So what makes this difficult? Well, how do you define what blocks go into your structure? Sure, we now have this ethereal concept of a structure, but what good is it going to do us if we cannot even create one structure? How do we populate the list? Conceptually, this part isn't really that hard either. It was more of just enacting it, getting it to start. And really, it's no more than just a bounds check. If you wanted to find all the blocks in a specific area, you would choose a minimum X and Y and a maximum X and Y. No much more different than the fill command in Minecraft. You could then loop through all your objects and see if their X and Y fall within these coordinates of this bounds, and then there you go. That block should go in the list. So initially I made the make structure command function pretty similarly to Minecraft's fill command where you enter the first coordinates and then the second coordinates and then you go on with your day. But that just kind of, it was arduous and I didn't really need to type multiple coordinates. So now, at this point, I have made a make structure command where I just type make structure and then the name and then it automatically saves the point I'm at as the first point, the minimum x or maximum x, it'll figure it out afterwards. And then I go to my second point diagonally in that bounds and click my mouse again and it creates the bounds. So we've defined what a block is, we've defined what a structure is, and we've maintained a list. Now what makes this cool? 
Well, we can kind of think of this as a Lego set on command. We can choose a point at anywhere in the world, run a simple command, and we spawn an entire structure where all the blocks are specifically relatively positioned to each other precisely the way they were initially. This opens the door to duplicating sections of a map to cut down on development time, or to just save a really pretty house you made, and I think that's pretty cool.